Good evening and welcome to the discussion. The very book of the cover says that it is Viralacharya's account of his efforts as Deputy Governor of Reserve Bank of India to resist the fiscal dominance undermining the pursuit of financial stability. Quest for restoring financial stability in India makes a proposition around which differences emerge on how independent the central bank should be. The author says that the central bank should be left alone to ensure stability in the financial system. This can be brought about with tight rules and regulations, good governance and non-interference from the government. The RBI is supposed to have roles that go beyond regulatory oversight. Two fundamental policy issues are often debated while considering monetary policy priorities whether to stimulate the economy by keeping interest rates low and monetizing government debt, or whether to ensure price stability by keeping inflation rates low. It was believed that early identification of bad debts and their quick resolution were possible through prudent oversight. But the government, and I quote from the book, has been reluctant to allow this to happen, especially during the last five years. Dr. Acharya describes a reversal of the healthy trend towards independence of RBI that was discernible in the first decade of this century. There are many more questions and answers that the book throws, and we are going to be capturing a few of them. The book suggests to recapital recapitalize banks, to create a public credit registry, to incorporate financial cycle in the monetary policy framework, to develop viable capital markets and to enhance the autonomy of the central bank. This and much more in this discussion on policy for financial stability. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure today to introduce our panel. Our author, Dr. Viral Acharya, economist, former deputy governor of RBI. He's CV star professor of economics at the Department of Finance at the New York University Stern School of Business and an academic advisor to the Federal Reserve Banks of New York and Philadelphia. He was also a member of the Academic Council of the National Institute of Securities Market and SEBI. Professor Ashima Goyal, Professor Emeritus at IGIDR. She was visiting fellow at the Economic Growth Center, Yale, and a Fulbright Senior Research Fellow at Claremont Graduate University. She's been on several government committees, including Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and RBI Technical Advisory Committee for Monetary Policy. Dr. Rupa Rege Nitsure, Chief Economist at LNT Finance Holding. Prior to joining the LNT, she worked as a Chief Economist at Bank of Baroda. She's also worked as a Senior Economist with ICICI. She has also served on the critical committees of Government of India and the Reserve Bank of India. Ms. Sonal Verma, Managing Director and Chief Economist at Nomura. Specializing in the analysis of trends in the Indian economy, she served the Indian government in order to design India's Industrial Production Index and was previously with Crisal and the ICICI Bank. Dr. Rajeshwari Sengupta, Associate Professor at IGIDR. In the past, she had held research, research positions at the Institute for Financial Management and Research, which is IFMR, RBI, and the IMF, along with the World Bank in Washington, DC. She was member of the Research Secretariat for the Bankruptcy Law Reforms Committee that recommended the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code for India. Mr. Dharm, uh, Dharma Kirti Joshi, Chief Economist at Crisil. With more than 20 years in economic research and consultancy, out of which 11 years spent at NCAER before he moved to the Central Electricity Regulatory Commission in New Delhi, and then with Crisil. He's a member of the Economic Policy Group of CII and Indian Merchant Chambers. Professor Anant Narayan, Assistant Professor and Head of Public Policy at SPGIMR. He served as Standard Chartered Bank's Regional Head for Financial Markets for ASEAN and South Asia, 
managing foreign currency, interest rates, commodities, derivatives, and debt capital market businesses across 12 countries. After tenures in fixed income and currencies trading at Deutsche Bank and the Citibank. And our moderator for today's show, Mr. Tamil Bandopadhyay, consulting editor, Business Standard, award-winning author and journalist. One of the members of the founding team of Mint, his earlier assignments, he was advising Bandhan Bank on its transformation from a microfinance institution to a universal bank. And Chairman Scotch Group, Mr. Kocher. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again. And with this, I hand the mic over to Tamil. Thank you. Thank you, Scotch, and uh, for giving me yet another opportunity to read this book once again. After he uh, normally, uh, this kind of tough book, I don't read twice, uh, it's, you know, year after, but uh, the, just to handle this, uh, uh, today's uh, moderation, I thought, uh, let me go through it once again. Uh, Dr. Acharya claimed that he burned midnight oil and poured every drop of economic reasoning and persuasion in, in this book on writing the speeches. So I also burned my midnight oil last night. I didn't sleep. I was going through it again. Okay. Uh, for the record, Dr. Acharya was Deputy Governor between 23rd January 2017 and 23rd July 2019. Uh, he stepped down before his actual term ended. And these speeches, it's a combination of, it's a collection of speeches with the foreword uh, by Dr. Vaibhi he, He's, in his own words, not only his voice, but his lifeblood. So it's very, very passionate. Uh, we will hear, uh, we will hear him and we'll hear others for the next, say, one hour, one and a half hour to even one hour, 45 minutes, depending on the flow. Uh, Policy for financial stability, quest for restoring financial stability in India. Uh, the book is the, uh, is the provocation or rather we will, we will, the, the takeoff point. Uh, and then after that, we will, we will discuss uh, everything else, what's happening all around. Because it was written two years back and since then COVID happened and right now the geopolitics. So everything will come in. And we'll also take a few questions. So those audience and for me, uh, good evening and good morning, depending on which part of the world you are attending from. Uh, for instance, Dr. Acharya, I think I had to get up early um, to join us. He's from New York. Sonal is from Singapore and rest of us are in different parts of India. Audience also will be from different parts of the world. Uh, and I don't know whether this is sheer coincidence or the scotch deliberately to celebrate World's Women's Day. You don't find so many women on a panel. So that's, that's a very interesting thing uh, and happy thing to say. So here are the rules. Where are the rules? I'll speak the list. Uh, let's, uh, let's start with Dr. Acharya first. Uh, let him talk uh, uh, about uh, financial sector stability, uh, financial policy for financial stability first. Uh, Dr. Acharya, probably you speak about five, six minutes on this. And then will, I will come in and ask you also, right now the context has changed because of the current geopolitics and the COVID. Have you, are you still sticking to the, those speeches and the opinion that you had in the book or you have changed? So overall, probably 10 minutes we'll talk. And then each of the panelists will go alphabetically in a brief way, first round reacting to what Dr. Acharya says. And then we will go uh, play by the ears. I have nothing, no script, because this is an happening thing and a lot of interest. And this is a star started panel. Over to you, Dr. Acharya, to start. You're on mute. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tamal. And uh, thank you to Scotch for... Uh, featuring the book and inviting me and having this wonderful panel. Uh, I look forward to their interactions. Uh, and in some ways, I hope that this topic would not be of interest to anyone anymore. Uh, but I think it remains evergreen. Uh, and so here we are. Um, I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to offer a view on India's last uh, 15 years, especially. Uh, it's a view. Uh, we may or may not agree on every single detail that I'm going to present, uh, but I think it's certainly worth a discussion. Uh, let me start with the reforms of 1990s and early 2000s. Um, I think these paved a way for India to embark on a path of high growth, 
But more importantly, it emboldened the reformers in the country to undertake institutional and market reforms. Uh, this included the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act for fiscal consolidation, the development of government bond markets, both for the center and the state, uh, so that the borrowings could happen at market rates rather than rates uh, forced on banks or set by the central bank. Uh, it involved flexible inflation targeting framework in order to build central banks' credibility in managing monetary policy to keep price stability as its anchor uh, so that external investors and households' inflation expectations could remain anchored. Uh, and equally notably, the Sarfezi Act and then the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code to deal with, uh, in a graceful but prompt manner, uh, you know, the defaulters of the Indian banking system. Uh, yet, uh, in my assessment, in the last 15 years, and especially since the global financial crisis, uh, as growth has been patchy at best under par, uh, the system as a whole has lost conviction uh, in these reforms. Uh, as I politely used to put it at RBI, we have gone back into the chalta hai, adjust karlo kind of an approach to our financial sector. Uh, it's best illustrated in the repeated failure to meet the FRBM targets, uh, continuing use of banks and the central bank to set GSEC and SDL rates, uh, in what I consider as an erosion in the effective operation of monetary policy where the emphasis or the primacy of the objective has actually pretty much shifted away from inflation back to growth and dilution of bankruptcy laws in the midst of what was seen as a demonstrated success uh, in getting tough and resolving the bad debts of incumbent industrialists. So how and why did we lose our way? Uh, who better to explain this than Dr. Y.V. Reddy? Uh, he was talking about uh, a historical backdrop of fiscal dominance in India, but he described the pre-1990s of India in a very nice way, where the government, the central bank, and the public sector banks uh, kept their accounts as though they were a Hindu undivided family. Uh, my sense is that something similar is underway. I would just expand banks to now include financial markets at, at large. Uh, we probably have to now countenance uh, financial dominance in addition to fiscal dominance uh, that uh, Dr. Reddy was talking about. Now, uh, I described a set of reforms. We have pretty much set them aside, you know, or softened them over time explicitly or implicitly. Yeah, you know, you talk about any one reform in the financial sector, people come up with case-by-case -case explanations. So these were the compulsions why I had to do it. These were the challenges this year. How could central bank not do anything else? How could the government not do anything else? Uh, in my view, when you look at that over a stretch of period, it just starts looking like excuses, excuses, and more excuses not to stick to macroeconomic principles for financial stability, for price stability, for fiscal stability. And uh, in the book, I try to explain in the prelude chapter especially why we need to entertain fiscal dominance in India seriously as a theory of explaining why India and its financial sector and its outcomes are what they are. Because, you know, you can come up with case-specific explanation that doesn't lead to much of a policy. Then you are just putting band-aids all the time on the problems that you have. So let me explain especially why and when fiscal dominance bites India the hardest. There is a time when fiscal dominance is not so bad. And this is when you have large growth shocks, such as the global financial crisis or the pandemic. In these times, long term and the short term are the same because you are trying to prevent growth from falling off the precipice. The world over fiscal and monetary authorities coincided at the uh, uh, outbreak of the global financial crisis and then the pandemic. However, usually a year or two after these shocks are over, things do normalize. Uh, no, most countries in the world, other than perhaps some frontier countries, are not talking about growth falling off the precipice. The war is a different situation, but I'm just talking about the pre-war, post-pandemic uh, horizon. 
This is a time, two years after the global financial crisis, say one and a half year after the pandemic, is when you would expect, again, policymakers to start focusing on the long term and not so much constantly on just what is short term. But I think this is, these are the points where, in my view, we basically do not get the policymakers in India to function independently. Now, I think very clearly and strongly that the central bank is not a part of the government. If it was to be part of the government, it would have been an executive office of the government. It is not. It is legislatively not an executive office of the government. There is an act that governs it. There is a legislative mandate that the governors and the board of the central bank have to adhere to. And these are specified in the letter of the law. There is no ambiguity about what is the function of the central bank as far as the letter of the law is concerned. This holds for uh, the judiciary, this holds for the enforcement offices, and this holds for bankruptcy courts and several other things. These are not parts of the government. These are not executive offices of the government. In a democracy, these institutions are supposed to function in a checks and balances sort of a system so that you balance differing objectives, differing horizons, and by allowing these non-executive offices or the institutions of the country to function in an independent manner, the, whole is that the, the, the hope is that for the people of the country as a whole, you achieve some long-run stable outcomes. In my view, fiscal dominance, which traditionally is thought of as government weighing down on the central bank in order to essentially help it continuously roll over its debts, in India takes a far more pernicious form. I'm going to focus on the central bank, but I think this broader erosion of institutions also requires some thinking about it. Uh, why? Because central bank in India, the Reserve Bank is an all-purpose central bank. It's in charge of regulation and supervision. It's in charge of debt markets and currency markets. Uh, it's in charge of the deposit insurance. So it also gets involved in resolution of failed financial firms and so on. Uh, Shock after shock after shock, uh, in case of the RBI, my sense is that first the monetary policy after the global financial crisis, then the regulation and supervision of banks, uh, then the botched monetary experiment of demonetization, the continuing forbearance on small and medium-sized enterprises, the dilution of the bankruptcy code, and in what I now consider as a growth-focused monetary policy rather than an inflation targeting monetary policy. These are to me just signs that one after the other, we are just serving some other purpose besides what these institutions were designed to serve uh, in the first place. And I think it's because the governments are constantly facing short-term compulsions. This is true the world over. They face elections, they have to be popular, they have to care about their reputations. It is not the job of the non-executive arms of the government to serve that objective. They are meant to perform a different role, in my opinion, other than when the long term and the short term are perfectly aligned so that growth doesn't fall off the precipice. If we are perpetually in that situation, the only explanation I can provide is that India is perpetually in a crisis for the last 15 years as far as growth is concerned. I don't think anyone can really justify that based on the levels of growth that we have actually witnessed in the economy. So the only explanation is that precisely what are the compulsions of the government are the compulsions of the economy every six months, every nine months, every 12 months. And I just don't think that passes the smell test of common sense uh, as far as it goes. Um, so I, I, you know, in, in my main sort of talk as, a, as the deputy governor, I described it as the discord between playing a T20 versus playing a test match. It requires a very different kind of a player uh, and I think, you know, I can give you interesting contrasts in an Indian audience, but, you know, uh, you can't have Rahul Dravid be the best T20 player, nor can you have Rohit Sharma be the best test match player. You know, it doesn't work. The only person who did it for a short while was Virendra Seva, but he also, his career was far short-lived than that of Rahul Dravid. Uh, now, what have been the consequences of this, of the fiscal dominance of the central bank? In my view, the primary consequence is that because the central bank continuously keeps accommodating or is under pressure to accommodate the short-term needs of the government, the government doesn't deliver on what it is supposed to do. 
be it public infrastructure, be it health, be it education, be it the disinvestment programs. Just look at how many times we have missed disinvestment programs in the last 10 years. You know, just look at the track record. Have we delivered even once? Uh, I, I challenge you to show me one year when we have met the disinvestment proceeds. Why does that happen? Because we are constantly accommodating the government borrowing program. We are constantly delivering bigger and bigger payouts using all kinds of policies that are possible in order to pay a larger dividend so that technically the government can say, oh, one of this uh, PSUs, technically it's not a PSU, but that RBI gave it a large dividend to meet the big hole that was created. There are far more pernicious outcomes. In my view, it is not a coincidence that our growth is not picking up because we have not had a big set of substantial reforms since the Vajpayee era. Uh, and why is that? Because we are constantly focused on short-term fixes. No one is actually giving the real message that our growth is not cyclically weak. It is right now structurally weak. You cannot fix structural weakness of growth of an economy with constant monetary stimulus, bandaging of the banking sector and the non-bank financial sector through relaxation of bankruptcy reforms that will help the incumbents stay in control of their assets for a longer period of time. So in my view, the real cost of all this is that everyone else is doing government's function other than the government. The government gets away with not focusing on the long term, is just able to go time by time, just bide over its next challenge, bide over the next auction, bide over the next uh, whatever cliff it has in terms of the local or the national elections. And in the end, it doesn't add up to much as far as delivering on the potential growth uh, of the country is concerned. Uh, in the book, I give a sketch of how this plays out in the rest of the system. I think it actually corrupts the rest of the system. Our industrialists are busy constantly hobnobbing uh, in New Delhi rather than focusing on becoming globally competitive enterprises. We, we need to have constant tariffs in the country in order to protect these industrialists. Uh, look at it from the outsider's perspective. India's trade policy is basically one of protectionism. Uh, it, it is of nothing else when you look at India's tariffs related to the rest of the world. So how can we be the global uh, growth giant uh, if we are not willing to embrace the reforms that are required to maintain price, financial and fiscal stability along the way of creating solid infrastructure, solid jobs, and you know, solid uh, long-term uh, growth. So what's the way out? I'm going to be just put one simple idea on the table. How about sticking to the laws we have in place? Okay, I'm going to just put it as a simple principle that I think India needs to adapt. We had an FRBM. We just kept wriggling around it in whichever way possible. We had an insolvency and bankruptcy code. What did we do? Within two years, we found ways to dilute it. Uh, we have an inflation targeting mandate. Its, its primacy, it's very clear. Its target is 4% CPI inflation. How about sticking to that? You know, How about doing that for a change? For 15 years, we have disregarded laws. We have gone from being growth hungry to growth anxious to now being growth desperate. In my view, the policy of last 15 years has not worked. So how about trying something that other countries do, which is to respect the letter of the law for their democratic institutions? Uh, if And, you know, in our posturing, we always say these laws are important. Flexible inflation targeting is there. We have a well-functioning bankruptcy court. We have FRBM targets. If it's so important to posture that these laws are there, the job, why don't we try to implement them de facto uh, and actually get them to deliver the mandates that they are supposed to be delivered. Why are we so, why do we find it so expedient and easy to set aside the wisdom of what may have gone in a very complicated lawmaking process when it comes to the implementation uh, of that law? So for now, at the cost of sounding a bit disappointed and critical, I fear that we have just been hobbling from one shock to the next over the last 15 years. We have no clear long-run path or trajectory for the economy. We keep trying to discover a new path every time a new shock arises. It's because we have shifted the focus away from long-run economic, macroeconomic stability targets. I'm not pessimistic, however. Uh, there is success in the economy. Just look at our tech services sector, look at our digital finance and its plumbing. 
uh, it seems many sectors are able to be successful regardless of this all pervasive fiscal dominance but again i think it is no coincidence that these are the sectors where the government the central bank the financial sector especially the banks are the least directly involved in my view it's because they are not as affected by fiscal dominance uh, as other sectors of the economy are but just imagine if month to month quarter to quarter year to year if our central banking was not just focused on meeting the ever expanding financing needs of what i consider a bottomless pit of the revenue expenditures of the government Uh, the central bank could do so much more that is how i felt when i was in job and i think uh, it's important for me to convey this for others to consider thanks thank you tamam thanks dr acharya i thought i'd split into two but you have actually covered everything even in the current uh, current uh, situation also uh, so you are uh, you said you are not pessimistic but uh, uh, barring the last few sentences it reeks of pessimism only nothing is happening in india that's the kind of thing your view sitting in new york but even where you were you were in uh, in india uh, you were a sort of rebel i think in your book you said not i think you bookin you said rbi lost its governor on the altar of financial sector stability okay i i, I don't think anybody else would have the guts to <laughs> to write that you said that so in the first round we'll ask each of the uh, panelists we have a star studded panel and most importantly ashima uh, is here who's a part of not rbi but rbi's monetary policy committee i mean when they you to talk about fiscal dominance and keeping uh, not inflation targeting at 4% but 6% you did not say that i am saying that 6% and um, accommodating government etc etc ashima will be very here to uh, will be very keen to hear ashima also uh, so let's first round uh, we'll get into other things later but first round will go alphabetically and i would like each of you to react to what he says do you agree or disagree uh, it comes anant is the first one anand two yeah, three sure. minutes uh, so each of I'll, i'll try and keep this really short uh, no no first, not too short two, two three four minutes but on his stay on his stay on yeah. the tacharya stay from new york yeah so this is a pure chance that my parents named me an and therefore i got first to go otherwise frankly in this august panel i should be the last person to speak i'm i'm not a trained economist i am a practitioner a sinful trader from the past for past days so uh, but uh, to start with uh, thanks again to the coach uh, really uh, great to be on this lovely panel uh, dr acharya i have to uh, mention he is a mentor in many ways uh, he has taught me a lot of things he continues to teach me a lot of things so i'm kind of a fan nevertheless i will try and disagree with him on a few things just to make life a little interesting uh, what you mentioned tamal da i think uh, that's the best thing i like about viral a he's brilliant uh, close your ears viral but um, and on top of that he has the ability to speak his mind so even if you disagree with him he will come with extremely cogent arguments and i think this country needs that we need people who can come with cogent arguments and challenge each other's uh, thought thoughts so that we can come and arrive at the right solution and more power to you viral i, I hope you continue doing what you're doing um I, I largely agree with a lot of what uh, Viral says, but I'm going to try and talk specifically about two things, which which he mentioned. Uh, one, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the flexible inflation targeting policy, um, and I want to take it up as an example of where I'm not convinced that, frankly, um, an, an academic institution or an academic framework uh, can really take on the mantle of a long term, uh, you know, uh, some, somebody who takes a, a guardian of the long term. as opposed to the 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 short term i will not i want to talk about the fiscal i won't talk about the fiscal i'll instead talk about uh, what uh, viral mentioned about about the real economy and I'll, i'll try and make a few comments about that as well let me start with the 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 monetary policy framework look as a practitioner uh, who's dealt in foreign exchange markets and in interest interest rate markets bond markets credit markets and so on and so forth continues to do so in some ways um it's an extremely complicated context if i was to put myself in rbi shoes okay uh, the rbi has a whole series of instruments that it can use of course it starts with the policy rate it starts with the liquidity amount of banking liquidity it can put or not put uh it has in intervention in 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 bond markets in government bond markets in in many other countries you also have credit markets where where central banks intervene into then you have the the fx markets and again you have a whole you know 
uh, range of F FX instrument swaps. You have short term, you have uh, a term structure of uh, FX rates as well. In bond markets as well, it's not just the short term, you also have longer in, in bonds. And you, you have macro prudential norms, which go along with it, which again are the realm of RBI. And finally, in some cases like the Bank of Japan, you also intervene in equity markets. So there's a whole range of instruments that are at the disposal of the central bank, which in turn has an impact on several financial markets. So liquidity and, 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 and short-term interest rates impact the money market curves. Your bond intervention impacts the entire range of the bond market, you know, from the short term to the long term to everything in between. Currency markets impact currency rates. Again, the entire term structure of currency rates in, in case of central bank is impacting equity markets, that as well. And of course, credit markets as well. Finally, all of these interventions which impact these markets have an impact on inflation, on growth, on investments, on employment, on financial stability, on a whole bunch of things. Now we can we can argue about what the actual impact of each instrument on each outcome is, but there is, there is a correlation, there is an impact. If I was to put this as a, I'm, I'm no academic, but if I was to try and express this, this is a very, very complex multivariate equation. There is, it's, it's, it's not a simple equation at all. It's like getting into a gigantic uh, locomotive, which has all these levers and all these, uh, you know, uh, indicators. And it takes, it takes a lot of understanding to figure out what you can do to impact what, right? Um, and here is a great rule that, for instance, doctors use as a starting point, which is first rule, do no harm. <laughs> do not assume that you know what's going to happen. Right Now, the, 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 the background to the current flexible inflation targeting regime was we had the Dr. Subara you know, period where unfortunately things got completely out of hand, no fault of his poor soul. You had, you know, or, you know, we can argue how much of his fault. Point is, you had a, a, a fiscal deficit which went completely out of whack. You had a current account deficit which went out of whack. Inflation went out of whack. Reserves kind of dropped down, and then eventually you had this fragile five and the taper tantrum, etc. So then people decided that you know what, if you leave the central bank in the doctor ready era of multiple in indicators, which is looking at multiple things and then trying to figure out what you need to pull to arrive at a financial stability metric, you're lost and then you'll have fiscal dominance as Viral says, because if government will sit on you and say, get this done for me and you'll find a way to justify what the government wants. So this is crazy. Let's have a simple rule-based um, you know, process. And thereby you had this Urjit Patel report in 2014, which came out and, and Rupa was part of that uh, uh, report as well. Um, so, so, and then you, you simplified life. You said, let's make it simple rule-based inflation and then you will use repo rate to control inflation. By the way, 45Z of the RBI Act says that. There is no mention of growth. It just says you will use policy rate, you MPC will use policy rate to arrive at whatever the government sets as your inflation target. That's it. There is no growth. There is no currency markets. There is nothing in, in, uh, implied anywhere else. Okay. I think this is ridiculous. I think this is you know trying to simplify a, 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 a complex situation like this and boiling it out to one repo rate impacting one inflation, I think is just oversimplification of the worst kind. Now, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in um, uh, Ashima's shoes and I'm glad I'm not there, but she's been charged with controlling inflation between two to 6% using one single instrument, which is the repo rate. She has no control over currency intervention. She has no control over the term structure of interest rates. She has no control over RBI bond intervention. She has no control over macro prudential norms. And believe me, all of this has an impact on inflation, growth, investments, employment, a whole bunch of things. So my fundamental reason why I'm giving this Ram, Ram Kani is the following. You know, sometimes um, academic processes which try to oversimplify an extremely complicated position to try and get hold of or try to control fiscal dominance, I suggest can end up with, with outcomes which are very, very questionable. And at the moment, I think what RBI is doing, and, and you, know, you can call it fiscal dominance, I think there is an element of fiscal dominance. But given that the markets, given that the, 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 the context is so complex, they're trying to use all these instruments Managing and Tim Bergen principle, which Viral told me or taught me about, which is every if you have six you know indicators to control, you need six instruments. You're trying to do all of that, and then trying to pretend you're still sticking to this lovely framework of flexible inflation targeting. So to me, this process of arriving at such regulations, and we need to have a more open debate about this. All the research I've seen justifying flexible inflation targeting does not answer a simple question: Can you really control re inflation in India using just repo rate? 
I don't think that I have seen any research which which actually gets to the crux of the matter. I'm going to keep that aside because I know uh, a lot of learned people on this panel are going to beat me up. Viral definitely is going to beat me up after this goes over. Uh, I want to come to the last bit, which is on the real economy, and there I completely agree with Viral. You know, I, I'm a teacher now. Um, I ask my students. We have a lot of debates about this monetary policy framework, fiscal FRBM, and I totally agree with uh, you know Viral there. I wish we had a, a CPO equivalent in India as well, which was more accountable. I wish we made a lot more noise about cash accounting in in budgets, uh, not having enough money into education, and, and and you know at the same time having all this egregious fudging of accounts earlier in FCI and now in a, in in your you know discom books and states etc. Um, uh, but then end of it all, I ask a simple question: Can you tell me what is the monetary policy framework of the People's Bank of China, uh, or what is the fiscal policy framework that's followed in China? And barring a few economists who have been there, done that, uh, there's a blank look. Uh, my simple point is exactly, I guess, what Viral was arriving at. You know, China did not become China because they had a fantastic monetary policy framework or a great fiscal policy framework. They got jobs and output in in shape. They created jobs, they created output, they fudged everything else, but they got jobs and output. The end of it all for us, I think, that the answer lies in the real economy as well. While fools like me who have nothing better to do will debate whether monetary policy framework is right or not. End of it all, we need things eventually to to translate into jobs and output. If we get that, frankly, the art of managing monetary policy, fiscal policy, all of that can become a lot easier. And to the to the to Viral's point, structurally, we have we have in the last fifteen years struggled to get that basic metric of jobs and output, domestic output, right. Uh, if we sort for that, a lot of the problems get will get solved. Thanks. But I'll stop it, Amalda. Yeah, thanks, Anand. I, I I'm not going to summarize and waste time. Uh, but only one point, uh, one thing I point out that you spoke about uh, uh, repo is the only instrument which is well. <laughs> you are half, this is half truth. I mean, what Reserve Bank of India did, they did not even need the MPCs thing, and reverse repo was used in a liquidity flash situation. Reverse repo became actually the policy tool, and reverse repo was cut. Um, uh, MPC uh, was not without any consideration of. I mean, without M taking MPC um, uh, discussing it at MPC. Uh, so anyway, these are all the intricacies. I would love to have kept Ashima actually as a last speaker, but I say we go alphabetically. So Ashima, over to you. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you, as Scotch, for the invitation and for putting together this. A bit louder. Panel. And for putting together this brilliant panel. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So I'm. Um, I'm. Uh, I agree with Viral on uh, the importance of financial of regulation and uh, laws, legal, etc., institutional reform for financial stability. But I'm uneasy with the emphasis on structural reforms, since stabilization is the first duty of monetary policy. And flexible inflation targeting, by academic definition, gives, gives weight to growth as well as inflation. That's why it's flexible. It gives you some time to reach the inflation target. And although there is a target of 4%, there's a tolerance band. All this is part of flexibility. And when will you need that flexibility? Except, I mean, more than at a time when something like COVID-19 happens. So uh, I think that he talks about repeated shocks, India lurching from one shock to the other. Now, this has been happening in the whole world. And these shocks are aggravated if there are no counter-cyclical measures. Finance, financial stability also worsens. There was a collapse of credit, the corporate bond market for which inflation targeting was strictly interpreted during the Urjit Patel years also collapsed. Credit growth collapsed in early 1920. It was just 12% of the previous year. And in this period, when we've had some increase in liquidity and the freeze on payments has abated, despite COVID, financial stability has surprised on the upside. The FSR uh, predictions were not achieved in, in the banks surprised on the upside. Even Moody's has noted this, the World Bank. You know that the Indian financial structure, uh, the sector turned out to be more stable than the rest of the world thought because of repeated articulation by uh, past deputy governors and governors. So if, if the, if if the financial sector surprised on the upside, it means there were no, no structural problems. Liquidity squeeze was the problem. 
the absence of lender of last resort when ILFS happened. So, and Viral's book talks about it necessary to tighten under uh, external, under quantitative easing when the rest of the world is responding to shocks by relaxing liquidity. But then this makes policy pro-cyclical with respect to the domestic cycle. And monetary policy must respond to the domestic cycle, not to what the US Fed is doing. The book also notices that when you have prudential regulation together with high reserves, and it does not notice that corporate and household leverage is in India is half of that of emerging markets. Corporates have been deleveraging. So the Reserve Bank has a lot of instruments to handle domestic external shocks without tightening domestic policy. And in effect, when the Fed was tightening in 2018, again, our policy was tightened. And that made things worse. So in the current, current uh, era, the support measures under COVID but are time barred. So they are in line with reforms. Only in the best tradition of micro prudential, regu macro prudential regulation, there was some relaxation. And I disagree that there have been no reforms and we've gone back on reform. Recently, we've had the GST after long differing finally implemented. The IBC has also been implemented recently. Relaxation was only for COVID and it's over now. It's all time barred. Flexible inflation targeting also started in 2016, not with the reforms in the 90s. We are setting up a, a bad bank, DFI, institutional strengthening continues. And the most important factor is that this has worked despite COVID. You know, people said India had the worst growth shortfall in 2020. But the recent IMF data shows many other countries, many in the West, Italy, France, UK, uh, they've all had a higher growth slowdown in 2020. And then people have said that our good recovery in the past year is due to the large slump that we saw in 2020. But our, but our recovery is better than that of other countries that had a greater slump. So it seems that things are working. Whatever is being done now, the stabilization, counter-cyclical macro policy is working. Outcomes are important after all. And then, uh, you know, in the Indian context, especially when you have supply shocks, the fiscal, when you have good coordination between monetary and fiscal policy, fiscal policy acts on the supply side, reduces supply side bottlenecks, inflation comes down. So inflation has stayed within the tolerance band despite the COVID shock and worldwide supply chain bottlenecks, which shows the power of coordination. You know, independence does not mean conflict. It does not mean fighting. It does not mean treating the other as an enemy. I think that's Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ashima. So while Anant was like me to a on certain areas, he has his own opinion and not exactly on the same page with Dr. Acharya. Uh, and on certain areas, he has certain other opinion. But Ashima is actually taking a different stance. And Dr. Acharya himself plays tennis, but he's very fond of cricket. So, and this book is full of cricket analogy, how government plays T20 and um, Reserve Bank should play Rahul Dravid five, uh, five day test match. Ashima and right now played for the central bank. <laughs> okay. So now, uh, DK, over to you. Sorry, sorry, Tamala, I played for India. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ashima played for India. Yes. Uh, DK. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I think uh, uh, I, uh, as you were saying, I also went through the, I haven't finished the whole book as yet, but I did manage to go through large parts of it. And uh, I think uh, there are many issues that Dr. Acharya is, which do need attention. Uh, but I'm going to look at, I think, uh, my remarks, uh, in my remarks, I'm going to focus more on uh, the aspect of financial stability, which is the ability of the financial sector to take shocks. And I think since we had one shock and the other one is coming. So in that context, I'll, I'll position my remarks. Sure. Uh, so I think Warren Buffet had famously said that you only know who is swimming naked when the tide goes down. So the tide did go down in 2021 when we, when we shrank. And we were expecting the banking sector, the NPAs to, to explode, actually. And that did not happen. I mean, and uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, right now, I think the situation is such that some of the non-performing assets, particularly in the corporate sector, I think they are, uh, they are reducing. I mean, and that, that 
uh, let me try to explain that how some of the reforms actually started during Dr. Acharya's time and even before that have actually helped. So it's not that pessimistic a scenario, so to say. So uh, let's come to the, the corporate sector. I think it's benefited somewhat from, uh, uh, from the deleveraging that has happened uh, during the pandemic. The GST regime itself favored the large corporates vis-a-vis -vis the smaller corporates, uh, which faced more compliance burden, and they have not been investing. So it's not a surprise that the financial profiles of the corporates are looking much better. Large corporates are looking much better right now. And uh, uh, the where I think the uh, the other contribution to the the lower NPA pressure from the corporates is due to the asset quality review, the PCA framework, even the acrylic. I think all this did help to clean up the process of uh, of, of 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 the I mean uh, of the banking uh, system, so to say. And uh, come uh, so that has I I think that has contributed quite a bit. And uh, uh, now coming to the IBC. Uh, the contribution of IBC, I agree, it's been diluted a bit, but it has structurally changed the mindset in India. I think that we have to agree. Uh, the, in India, it was said that businesses get sick, but never the businessmen. But I think now the businessmen also do fear of getting sick. I mean, because they can, they can lose their companies. The promoters are really worried about that. And we've seen instances where a case goes to the IBC and immediately the promoter is trying to return the money to the to the to, to to the lender, I mean, so which essentially means that there is some kind of discipline which is coming in, uh, uh, and I think the the IBC probably needs to focus more on the sanctity of timelines, etc. And I think and and the proportion of debt recovered, but broadly, I think it's moving in the in the right uh, right direction. Uh, on the fiscal dominance side, I think Dr. Acharya has a point. Actually, Marvin Kin did point out in 2019 in, the, uh, in one of the remarks to his book that, uh, that it's an issue not only for India, but I think globally also. After 2019, I think fiscal dominance is all pervasive. I mean, the debt levels have risen so much that we cannot get back to the pre-pandemic uh, pre equilibrium rates. I mean, they'll be much, much lower now. So uh, it, I think uh, one can think of fiscal dominance in uh, having a play there as well. But I want to, I think uh, coming, uh, I'll refer to his book and I want to highlight two things which uh, Dr. Acharya mentioned on this chapter on fiscal dominance. One was that the government accounts are typically not transparent. And uh, now I think the budget does make some attempt to make the accounts transparent. And many people have commented that you can, you can take them on face value because the kind of uh, acrobatics that used to happen on food fertilizer subsidy uh, through bonds, et cetera, I think that's, that's, that's stopped. So I think there is a, there is, there is a, there is a lot of uh, tr movement towards transparency. Uh, second was, I think I read out from his book, I think, which says that, uh, 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 you'd noted, I think, in the book uh, uh, that the the focus is short term. I mean, which you, I think, now also reiterate. And this, uh, it's on expanding the, uh, it's not on expanding the pie, but on on short term needs. But I think the budget, uh, if I look closely, it does make a departure from that. I think government has been fiscally conservative, so it kind of tilts towards uh, towards the capex spending. So. That, I mean, that may reduce the side effects of fiscal dominance to some extent, if at least the money is being used, uh, used for, for right purposes. Uh, and I think uh, 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 these, I think, do contribute to sustainability of fiscal stance to a limited degree. I think a lot does need to be done. And fiscal FRBM, we've only met the target once in the last 30 years. I mean, that was, that was a year of exceptionally high growth. Uh, so I do believe that central banks uh, cannot be disconnected from the realm of the government completely. Uh, my former boss, uh, Paul Shed, used to remind uh, me often of a statement by one of the Fed officials that central bank is independent of the government, is, not, is independent within the government, but not of it. So basically within the realm of the policy, I agree with Dr. Acharya that there should be enough uh, operational independence with the central bank to conduct its, uh, its policy. So let me stop there. Thanks, thanks, um, DK. I think Ashima will be all smile because largely you are taking Ashima's stance and Ashima says he is playing for India and he is, uh, she is playing for India and she is actually Rohit Sharma probably because captain of all uh, 20, 20, 20, 50 years, uh, 50 overs as well as test cricket, right? Uh, you spoke about non-transparent. Yeah, Dr. Acharya's book spoke about accounting jugaad, 
that the budget yeah. is talking about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it seems like both you and Ashima are saying that things are changing. It's not correct that to the, we, do, we are not looking at, we are not doing structural reforms. We have been doing it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you, lastly, you said that, um, yes, you are independent, but you are answerable to parliament. You did not say that, but that's what you meant, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, yes, Rupa. Uh, no, no, before Rupa, we, Rajeshwari, by that, Rajeshwari comes to you. Reacting to first round, reacting to Dr. Acharya's comments. And then we'll get into some micro details depending on the time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And I, of course, want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this esteemed panel. Uh, Viral, of course, it has made some excellent points. And needless to say, I, I mostly agree with him. And I do share his pessimism by and large that he has expressed. Uh, I would like to make two comments which are primarily related to what he said, but maybe taking a little bit of a, a different angle. So the first point is, is again, in the context of monetary policy. Uh, it's related to the objective. So the RBI for the longest of time has been overburdened with multiple objectives, right? And we have seen that we have lived through it. There's been inflation, growth, exchange rate, financial stability, interest rate, the entire gamut of it. Inflation targeting as a law was supposed to relieve the RBI from that burden and define the focus of monetary policy a little bit better. And then put the focus of monetary policy primarily on price stability. And the law says with an eye on growth. So the primary objective of monetary policy is price stability as per the act. But it has not worked and we need to ask why. And Viral says one main reason is fiscal dominance. And of course, it's very important. Um, but also, I think the other reason and and on fiscal dominance itself, I don't think India is unique. Uh, for example, if you look around the world, um, Western in Western countries, the central banks have significantly expanded their balance sheets in the context of the pandemic. In the US itself, the Fed has expanded balance sheet from, I believe, 4 trillion to 9 trillion. And uh, recently we have seen, despite inflation in the US going to four decade high, the Fed has been quite reluctant to increase the interest rate, uh, maybe the subject to political pressure. So this whole idea of fiscal dominance, now US may not have fiscal worries that it is concerned about, but the idea of central bank being independence being compromised because of political pressures is not something that is unique to India. That's one thing that I wanted to point out. And secondly, I think the reason is, one is of course fiscal dominance. The other reason to paraphrase a bit is that governments all around the world are concerned about growth and distribution of income. And they are hoping that somehow the central bank using its weak monetary policy will be able to achieve that. So in some sense, the entire responsibility of rescuing the economy seems to have been placed at the feet of the central bank using monetary policy. As long as that continues and until the governments change the stance that reviving growth is their responsibility through reforms and institutional changes and not the responsibility of the central bank, I don't think central banks will ever get the autonomy and the independence required to squarely focus on inflation. And the second point I wanted to make, which is related to, I think, what Viral said in context of institutions, while we have passed the law of inflation targeting and on paper, on a de jure basis, we are an inflation targeting country, do we even have the strong institutions required to implement inflation targeting? For example, transparency and accountability are two very critical pillars of inflation targeting to communicate to the public the credibility of uh, the inflation targeting institution. During the pandemic in 2020, for three quarters in a row, the CPI inflation crossed the upper level of 6%. By the law, the RBI is required to send a letter to the parliament. Now, this goes back to DK's point about answerability to the parliament. RBI is supposed to send a letter to the parliament explaining why this happened and what it plans to do going forward. But that, I believe, was not done. On the point of transparency, currently, for example, the 91-day Treasury bill rate is close to 3.8%. We have now have an effective reverse repo rate, as the governor announced, which is close to 3.9%. So while this is happening, the actual repo rate and the reverse repo rate have not been touched. Um, and of course, the repo rate still, it's not been abolished. So it is it's imposing some kind of a ceiling on the short term rate. So they are stuck at 3.8 and 3.9. So it almost seems that the RBI is doing monetary tightening by stealth, while officially maintaining that we are going to keep an accommodative stance as long as it takes. That is a complete lack of clarity about what are the goals of monetary policy and what are the instruments of it. So if RBI is going to follow multiple objectives, and I'm not going to argue into that because that's a very long debate, because I really don't think we are doing inflation targeting. So if RBI has to follow multiple objectives, at the very least, it can communicate that what its objectives are and how it is planning to balance the conflicting goals. 
and take the MPC into consideration because recently we have seen that there is an MPC statement, there is a governor communication, and there are a lot of differences between the two. For example, the MPC does not talk about the effective reverse repo rate uh, or this kind of a surreptitious increasing of monetary policy rates that's going on. Whereas MPC is supposed to be in charge of monetary policy under inflation targeting. So I think we are on paper an inflation targeting country. I don't think on a de facto basis we are. The last point I would like to make to Viral is, and to the panel is that fiscal dominance, the way I see it in India, is reflective of broken politics. There is a lot of political dominance of policies, economic policies. So for example, we have seen recently oil prices have gone up to 130, 140 barrels uh, per barrel, uh, dollar per barrel. But uh, we see that because of state legislative elections, we are not really seeing the effect of the oil crisis yet. Now, in that kind of a situation, how can you forecast inflation? Because the central bank does not even know when oil prices will increase and to what extent it will be passed on and so on and so forth. So there's a clear political dominance of economic policies, which happens maybe in a welfareist statist economy such as ours, where we are trying to impose a lot of Western kind of reforms on this kind of a structure. But given our weak institutions, uh, we are failing repeatedly. So I'll stop there and... Thanks, thanks, Ajashari. I think you have, you have added a new dimension. One, uh, you are talking about uh, why don't you directly re uh, raise the reverse repo instead of doing it to what you said by stealth. I mean, uh, what uh, a market believes that this is the way of doing it slowly um, without any creating any disturbance but achieving the purpose. Uh, anyway, that's a different point of view. And other thing that new dimension you spoke about, it's uh, fiscal dominance and also the political dominance, the politics of it. Uh, anyway, so next is Rupa, your turn. Yeah, yeah. thank you uh, very much, Tamal and Scotch Foundation for giving me this opportunity. Uh, well, I had reviewed uh, Dr. Acharya's book when it was published and I was greatly impressed by it. It's uh, written with tremendous academic uh, rigor and strong sense of conviction. I broadly agree uh, with this uh, first principle of economics, which he also is advocating, that any country when it has relatively lower uh, fiscal deficit uh, is always in a better position uh, to implement uh, macroeconomic policies and management. There is no doubt about it. But then, uh, you know, I find uh, certain inconsistencies and uh, systemic, uh, systematic biases uh, in uh, some of his uh, recommendations, uh, which uh, I would like to highlight here. Because uh, he, uh, you know, for him, uh, the best solution for this is uh, privatization. Now, uh, privatization of uh, banks. Uh, but empirical studies, uh, if you look at uh, the performance of Indian PSBs and private sector banks between 94 and 2011, actually, uh, you know, uh, their uh, performance converged for this long period of time. It started uh, diverging from the global fina uh, financial crisis of 2008, and uh, it became very marked after 2011. No, NPA pain uh, in large corporate exposures was equally felt by uh, private sector banks. But unlike public sector banks, they were allowed to exit their corporate exposures much earlier. Also, they had various other avenues to hide, hide their NPAs. Now, I have a simple question. If uh, while most of the large corporate exposures were syndicated by both the public sector and private sector players, how can one blame only public sector banks for serious dilution of underwriting standards? That is my first question. Secondly, it, is, uh, it was a very legitimate demand of uh, Reserve Bank of India uh, to have more power and control over uh, public sector banks. But then uh, apparently, you know, there was a delay, delayed action against the airing officials uh, in large and systemically important private sector banks, uh, 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 where RBI had claimed that it has enough powers to deal with uh, private sector players. Also, when so many irregularities were getting reported one by one after another by large private sector banks and now also from some large uh, uh, private sector exchanges, etc. in succession, why uh, he has referred to them as idiosyncratic issues and not as a systemic problem. And 
again i feel when it comes to equalization of net regulatory burden to different ownership groups by that i mean private sector public sector etc then why a thought is not given to bring entities other than public sector banks under the purview of central vigilance commission because they are also raising public deposits so some of these anomalies i don't understand uh and if because of fiscal dominance if uh, the role of reserve bank of india as a financial regulator if it has weakened then why privatization of psbs is being advocated so strongly because of fiscal dominance if regulatory architecture uh, architecture has become weak then we know we all know that empirical studies have clearly shown that uh, private sector banks play an efficient role in financial development only under a strong and independent regulatory agency then why this is being advocated also about structural reforms uh, all structural reforms entail adjustment cost on the economy uh, if they are not well planned we have seen that happening in case of gst also dk also raised this point that how uh, small companies uh, uh, you know small and medium corporate Uh, faced uh, uh, formidable issues uh, because the it portals had not stabilized etc so uh, i feel uh, while the steps like asset quality review launching of ibc public credit registry project with dr acharya himself had brought they they were extremely laudable steps very effective and help improve the sense of financial sector stability the prompt corrective action on uncapitalized banks pca action or the lack of lender of last resort kind of mechanism for nbfcs actually tended to increase uh, the intensity of economic downturn during that time when economy was at the lowest point of growth in the past decade so how we can say that help that help in promoting financial stability during that era finally i feel uh, that this whole debate is being raised during uh, this pandemic time uh, when uh, which cannot be uh, we cannot it is not a event comparable to earlier shocks even the gfc you know because the disruption uh, caused by it has been massive we have not just lost the means of livelihood but also lives and i don't think uh, uh, the anorg the pains uh, in the unorganized sector in formal economy uh, uh, have uh, are reduced uh, significantly even today and uh, you know uh, uh, even though i have worked on inflation targeting framework and i fully support uh, that framework i feel that how a central bank will be able to stick to well designed rules for decision making under this atmosphere of extreme uncertainty you know when we we are talking about india's uh, return of fiscal dominance but if you look at the uh, imf reports uh, post pandemic on an average all countries uh, have uh, deviated from their rules by 4 to 5% of gdp so india is not alone in that and uh, based on uh, you know because and in this kind of and today this is again followed by uh, uh, geopolitical tensions and war which has increased the extent of uncertainty so it is practically impossible today to make forecasts about future output and inflation uh, risks uh, uh, you know which india will face because we always say that monetary policy framework always has a forward looking approach can any one of us say that after two months or three months where what will be india's uh, growth inflation trade off or where will it be there are there are wide guesses so based on behavioral macroeconomic model uh, some economists are suggesting that central bank actually should not be forward looking in the times of crisis it makes sense to adopt policies based on current conditions rather than forecasts also i feel uh, that uh, uh, our budget making exercise to say some positive things that definitely as dk said it has become more transparent you know all of budgetary items now they have uh, they are explicitly accounting for in the budget which is a very good thing this time uh, even um, the projections about revenue and expenditure are more conservative uh, they try to give a push to economy through capex etc but i feel uh, uh, they should have focused more on economic uh, 
stabilization measures, uh, demand stabilization measures, because that is uh, the problem today. And that's why benign interest rate environment has not helped uh, incentivizing investments, private sector investment. And this whole focus on long gestation period infrastructure projects uh, uh, cannot guarantee the kind of recovery which we are aspiring for. And the whole success of this uh, uh, fiscal calculation will be dependent on uh, how strong uh, will be the economy economic recovery. And from that perspective, I feel uh, that we cannot uh, say with certainty uh, that with uh, the present budget, uh, we will uh, uh, achieve our goals uh, sooner than later. So that uncertainty still continues. Thanks. And, thanks. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Rupa. I think uh, Rupa too has, uh, as you are even, um, um, even uh, not only you are contradicting certain ideas of uh, Dr. Acharya, but you're seeing here strong biases also. On certain areas, we'll we'll discuss that later, time permitting. But before that, uh, Sonal has been patiently waiting. <laughs> Sonal, over to you. Thanks a lot, Tamal. Uh, and uh, I think my fellow panelists have already covered most of the uh, issues. Uh, I mean, I would say that uh, you know, Dr. Acharya has been a vocal uh, proponent of uh, policy prudence. Uh, we've seen this during his tenure in the book uh, and today in his opening remarks. Um, um, from my side, I think uh, uh, it's not black and white. There are always shades of gray. And, uh, you know, there are aspects on which I would agree with him uh, and aspects on which uh, I would disagree with him. Um, let me first uh, talk about the areas of uh, disagreement. Now, uh, the issue of, you know, rigid adherence to rules, I think cannot be applied at all times. Uh, it should be applicable at most times. Uh, but when the house is on fire, you need to douse the fire first and then, uh, you know, worry about things like moral hazard. And I think during the shadow banking crisis, uh, one of the risks, at that point in time was uh, rigid adherence to uh, the rule-based policy. And I think at such times, uh, judgment uh, becomes more important uh, because you have to get the patient out of the ICU first. Um, the second uh, aspect, I mean, you know, he, he mentioned and I completely agree that uh, growth has disappointed. To what extent should we blame it on purely fiscal dominance? Because if I look at, uh, you know, both EMs as well as DMs, most have been complaining about uh, how growth has fallen. And there have been multiple explanations around this, too much debt, aging population, lower productivity, deglobalization, etc. So, you know, to what extent there's a role for global factors, both in the up cycle we saw during 2004-2007, and sort of the lost decade we've seen since the GFC. So we need to give some consideration to those factors as well. Uh, the third point is on reforms and structural reforms. Uh, I think there have been reforms. Uh, um, you know, uh, 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 my fellow panelists mentioned GST, etc. I think uh, even stuff like uh, production link incentive scheme, national infrastructure pipeline, in fact, the biggest crib, uh, you know, during the pandemic has been why is the government so focused on supply side reforms? How will you get growth going if there isn't enough demand side consumption stimulus? So actually, the criticism on fiscal policy has been on the other side. And which basically raises the question, what are we missing here? If we are doing some reforms and yet we are not able to get growth, what does it boil down to? Is it that it's going to take more time uh, for growth to show up? Or is it that we are announcing reforms, but you know there are last mile uh, things that we are not addressing uh, and therefore the reforms are basically not uh, effective. So I think those are sort of the broader considerations we have to also uh, you know, keep in mind. Let me now come to the areas where I think, uh, you know, uh, there are 
Uh, and I'm going to put this in the current context where I think the points that he raises are very relevant today. Uh, he started off saying he hopes, uh, you know, his views and the points he made are no longer relevant, but uh, they are. Um, and I think we need to be alert to that. Uh, one, uh, inflation tolerance has been higher in the last two years. Uh, yes, it's been a pandemic, uh, but India is not the only country that's gone through pandemic. Uh, if you look through other countries in EM Asia, uh, inflation hasn't shot up as much. Uh, and I think it completely makes sense to tolerate higher inflation in 2020, maybe in 2021, uh, but 2022 with expectations drifting higher uh, is clearly you know, needs an evaluation in terms of the risk reward from this uh, policy uh, stance that we are taking. Second is the, um, you know, management of this entire government borrowing and with the latest uh, budget and what we know from states borrowing, how are we going to normalize liquidity if the entire focus is on uh, where government bond yields are? And this is a very, very practical challenge we are facing and are going to face uh, in this uh, financial year. So I think this is extreme, extremely relevant. The third point from the financial broader financial stability point of view, I don't think this is a risk right now. But everybody seems to be extremely keen on doing housing loans. So uh, perhaps there is enough uh, risk assessment, credit risk assessment, uh, and it makes sense for home loans to be less than 7%, even though there is some stress in certain pockets on consumption side, incomes haven't grown. Uh, but uh, it, you know, it is during such periods of extreme accommodation where we need to be alert to whether we are sowing the seeds of any future instability. And I think he does raise some very relevant points, uh, which we need to keep in mind because it has an implication on the kind of growth profile that we are going to see going forward. Thanks, Sonal. So if I if I uh, keep Dr. Acharya out as an author, the rest of you are the six panelists. I think uh, Ashima and DK, uh, have more reservations than others. But even if it's on an average, I find that all of you have more reservations than agreement with Dr. Acharya's theories and, and point of view and all. So we have about now uh, 6.40, so another half an hour times. Uh, we'll get into certain micro issues, but before that, in all fairness, it's not a debate but like Dr. Acharya versus the rest of you, nothing like that. So we don't want to degenerate into that. But before that, I would uh, request Dr. Acharya, if you would like to say something uh, after hearing all of them, few minutes, not long. <clears throat> would you like to comment on a few minutes uh, on their observations? And then we'll get into some micro pieces. And we'll end, uh, it's a very important uh, thing, which I think all of us would like to ask you your recommendations in the current scenario. That's the last last round. But before that, we'll have a quick few rounds, depending on the time. That's why I would request all of you, urge all of you to be as brief as possible. But before that, Dr. Acharya, would you like to uh, respond to any of the observations? Yeah, no, I think these are great points and uh, I fully respect everyone's views. Uh, I'll just put a few counter points, maybe just put facts on the table. I'll leave it to you to assess whether it uh, whether you want to revise your priors based on that or not. Uh, and, you know, in all fairness, uh, I think by my revealed preference, I, I quit the job. Uh, I felt the system didn't have confidence in my views, uh, <laughs> neither, neither right around me nor in the broader country. And so at some point you have to take a call whether you might be pouring your lifeblood into it, but if the system doesn't have confidence in you, then uh, is it really, are you the right person for the job? Maybe the system should give the chance to someone else. And, you know, in all earnestness, that was the primary reason why I left. And perhaps there is someone in the job who the system has greater confidence in. But I think, let me let me leave that personal thing aside, which is, uh, I think I agree on uh, there not being sort of one instrument to deliver the objectives of monetary policy. Uh, in all fairness, though, when I look at the public debate around inflation, it's entirely one-sided. We had inflation surprises during my term, which were on the downside. Inflation was lower than where it was supposed to be. We were getting help 
from the government, from the rest of the system. No one is getting hell right now at RBI. Okay, you can have inflation at six percent. I'm guaranteeing you, if inflation goes to six and a half percent, seven percent, wholesale price index is in double digits right now. Not a single person has mentioned this, but it is in double digits. The pass through could start. The pass through of oil may start very soon. I'm telling you, the system is biased asymmetrically in favor of growth and away from inflation. In my view, that is what it is supposed to be. Businesses and governments are supposed to be pushing more for growth. In a checks and balances system, the central bank has to rein that in and ensure that whatever has been legislatively set as the target. If you don't like four percent, I'm perfectly fine with it. Change the law, make it six percent, make it seven percent, make it eight percent, but don't have a law and then say, "Listen, this is not my target because I have compulsions right now." No. You can't go and fire a person on the street because you have compulsions right now because that's not the letter of the law of the country. So you know, I, I'm I know this may sound very purist, but the reason why laws exist for financial institutions is because they are supposed to drive the operating mandate of the institution. If you think during the pandemic that is not the right target, the government can go. And change the law for two years or for four years, and say we don't think four percent is the right target anymore. You know, you can't have a law and then do something else, and then have communication that doesn't give the market or the households any clear expectations of where the central bank believes the inflation is supposed to be. So I think that is what I'm. So I'm. I'm not saying the job is about just the repo rate. I'm not saying the job is just about, uh, you know, delivering on that. But I'm saying if you have a law. You are a technocrat. You have to respect the legislative mandate. If you don't like it, convince the parliament, convince the government to change the law. Uh, that would that is that would be my my preference. I think uh, a, a second point here, which is that I, I know that globally this is a problem. I am writing academic papers globally, also pushing against excessive monetary policy not having delivered. I'm on Paul Sheard's mailing list. He keeps giving Japan as the example of success of accommodative policy. He pushes for modern monetary theory. Why is Japan the role model of growth and inflation for any country? I really don't agree with Paul Sheard at all. If we want to Japanify the entire world, yes, let's go ahead with the policies that Japanese adopted. Let's have zombie lending. Let's have Uh, you know, disinflation, and let's have very poor growth. Let's in let's manage everything, including equity prices, right from the go. I'm completely skeptical that the success of Japan can be used as Paul Sheard uses as the role model for policy for the rest of the world. Um, I, I think let me pose one uh, danger to Ashima from the policy that you have proposed, which is that I think what you what you risk right now, and this is sort of my concern for RBI. uh and uh, it is as much a concern for india as you are concerned for india which is that uh, i think right now rbi runs a real risk that it's neither going to deliver on growth nor on inflation and i think the mandate of rbi is to deliver on price stability i think if rbi doesn't deliver on growth in my view that doesn't destroy rbi's credibility as an institution because that is not the legal mandate of rbi we can interpret it the way we like technocrats can say i have the right to interpret the mandate as i want but what matters it's what's your credibility as an institution when others are investing money in the country they are they are investing money in the country based on central banks inflation targeting and the ability to meet that objective i think right now there's a real danger in my view it may be precipitated by the oil shock that rbi may fall short on neither having growth because we are still below the pre trend levels uh, as far as growth is concerned i believe we are 7% below the pre trend growth applied to pre pandemic nor are we there uh, on inflation there's a sense in which why it all seems like it has worked uh, and i know that because i have spoken to my friends in india it's because the wealthy in india have become even wealthier during this period and that's because of the stock market boom because they've had the stock market boom they are all buying houses they are buying luxury cars monetary policy has not touched the informal economy monetary policy has not created jobs that were broken down 
during the pandemic in the if monetary policy really wanted to boost growth it really wanted to boost demand i think it needed a diagnosis of where did the pandemic hit the hardest and create targeted policies to deliver on that instead monetary policy has done what was convenient which was to buy a ton of government bonds create monetary stimulus which primarily has had a wealth inequality impact this is happening in the united states as well i'm not just critical of india this is exactly the same it's just that the us had fiscal capacity to simultaneously transfer checks uh, to the very poor uh, in the economy and that brings me to uh, one point which i want to stress which is why there why is there no fiscal capacity to spend everyone just says oh the government is not doing enough in my view we have reached this initial condition over a period of 15 years because at each point of a shock we have said we will abandon the frbm targets there has been no path of consolidation thereafter whether it is 2 years 3 years 4 years 5 years after that shock the only time india had fiscal consolidation over the last 15 years when we had the oil price bonanza after 14 15 oil price crash and it's no coincidence in my view that we had a set of terrible things happen in the economy one after the other once that oil price bonanza started gradually disappearing the moment oil prices hit 70 80 90 in india the fiscal pressures mount whether we like it or not there is pressure on the government and the rbi to work together to bail out the government borrowing program because there isn't any real consolidation and i think uh, i i uh, i agree with rupa that i fundamentally think the government should not be in public business you can call it a bias if you want but i think it's an informed bias i'm looking at average performances of public sector companies and private sector companies i'm not at all denying there is a yes bank and there are housing finance companies that are massive problems in the private sector there are huge huge governance issues the the point is that on average look at the depositor behavior in india the depositors actually enjoy stronger guarantees in public sector banks where are the deposit flows going in tamil's book he shows that eight more than 80% of the new deposits are actually going in private sector banks it is because they are providing better services to the consumer my driver moved out of a public sector bank into a private bank because he was not getting the quality of banking services that he he was desirous of so in my view why india needs this investment is not because i think purely that private sector enterprises on average run better i think it's because india needs to fund its expenditures through non debt borrowing programs the moment it starts relying more and more on debt it creates a natural point for compromising rbi's inflation policies see there are no chinese walls inside a governor's mind you know so if you are asked to target inflation and simultaneously you have to manage the debt program you can see how a governor of a central bank is going to act he is going to balance the two objectives he has two deputy governors one in charge of monetary policy the other in charge of the debt management program coming to his office with exactly conflicting advice on what he should be doing with the monetary stimulus right now one is saying take off monetary stimulus the other is saying no provide monetary stimulus so that i can clear the option that's a that's going to be an inherent compromise so i am in yeah. favor of disinvestments primarily yeah. to actually reduce government's reliance on debt borrowing just one last point yeah. if i can make uh, and i'll yeah. finish there which is on the ilfs uh, yeah i think the system is very critical of us i could see that Uh, let me just tell you uh, i tried to say it in two pages in the book without taking names but i will just say it openly here in our opinion there were real bad apples in the non bank financial system we spoke to analysts we spoke to short sellers we spoke to our supervisors we knew there was a triumph triumph variate i will not take the names of these companies that were doing a ring around to hide their losses we did provide liquidity we did expand that was the time when we moved gradually from deficit to a surplus system we did not provide direct liquidity because we knew there were bad apples in the system some of them are still coming out and some of them are still under judicial investigation as we speak 
we did not want the central bank to get into a situation of lending directly to bad apples in the system there was one way out which was to do aqr of the nbfc system and then do it there was no support for that politically okay i will i'm i'm stating this on record we would not have been allowed to do an aqr of the nbfc system at that point of time and why is that because no one wanted bad news to come out there, there was an election in 6 months time i'm sorry i'm 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 going to say this there was an election coming out the only reason why we were wanted to do stimulus of the nbfc system was to paper over the problems exactly the way we papered over the npa problems for several times in the period before my question is the following if nbfcs were healthy why weren't banks lending to them when they had all the liquidity in the world from rbi to do it what we wanted was no that there should be lending even to the bad parts of the system and i am just sorry we had just come out of a five year problem of lending to bad corporations in we have seen the fruits of that i agree that we have now deleveraged and the system is not in that problem and i am glad that many of you think the reforms we put in place were actually contributing to this i wish there was more such support when we were actually in office for this there wasn't actually when we were in office all of these were seen as very constraining reforms to growth uh, but we have seen what happens when you allow lending to bad organizations i don't think moral hazard is is something you can ignore even in the midst of a crisis we try to fiscally stimulate by lending to bad companies and we have been paying for it for the last decade our point was if banks can scrutinize the nbfcs and figure out who to lend to let them do it we will give them as much liquidity that they want and actually by the way this is the approach rbi has always followed in lending to nbfcs correct me if i am wrong but even in the last monetary stimulus rbi has not lent directly to the nbfcs but i could be wrong i think rbi has lent indirectly to the nbfcs via the banking system it has not lent directly to the nbfc so Thank what we did was no different than the monetary stimulus uh, of the yeah. thanks but, thanks but dr acharya yeah, yeah. i mean yeah i mean uh, thanks for being so so candid and spilling the beans uh, and in giving a peek into what happened in the governor's room when he's to when he is with two deputy governors uh, we'll quickly cut into because we are close to 8757 but this 3 minutes or 2 minutes i would like ashima to come in before we get into some micro discussion because dr acharya says that rbi is challenged now rbi now it's time to decide between growth and inflation you can't have both and you end up making it a mess uh, because nobody even if it growth doesn't happen nobody is going to blame central bank but you must stick to inflation targeting that's what essentially dr acharya said so ashima being a member of npc just 2 minutes i want your comment on that and then we'll cut into a few pieces uh, micro pieces yeah yeah i'm just okay. switch to this microphone can you hear me yes yeah absolutely so good. fine good good yeah i i want to reply to viral uh, that uh, there are all kinds of pressures but i assure him and the panel that the rbi is fully focused on inflation targeting that even in this very difficult period inflation has stayed within the tolerance band but when inflation is largely caused by supply shocks if you tighten demand then there's a very large output sacrifice that's what theory tells us we have a lot of unemployment so you don't take that route to reduce inflation but you signal that you are in that band you're serious about it and you have coordination with the government for example they cut fuel taxes now after the 14 when fuel prices crashed they raised taxes even in the covid period they they kept taxes high because the tax revenues had fallen they raised a lot of taxes from oil and so now as revenues become buoyant if you use oil taxes counter cyclically you have some room to absorb the pain of a rise in oil prices if it is going to be temporary if it is going to be permanent and persistent of course you have to take that output sacrifice so we will see how it evolves but and and i would like to tell them also that the government as well as the public at large in india is very very committed to inflation it is not a pressure on growth only there is huge pressure on the rbi just see in this panel for example whenever inflation so remember that we have stayed in the tolerance band in a very difficult time it is a difficult time for monetary policy but i think inflation targeting flexible inflation targeting will help us deliver 
Yeah. Thanks, Ashima. Very, very reassuring uh, yeah. uh, to hear from you, an NPC member. And there are other so, supply side. You know, like this Gati Shakti, they are reducing logistics costs in India. So, a lot of supply side that reduce bottlenecks, keep inflation lower. Yeah. Okay. And also, we Thank don't have the wage pressures that you see in the US. Thank you. So, the audience, you are hearing one NPC member that commitment is unwavering uh, to inflation targeting. Now, let's quickly two, three issues. One is. Uh, Rupa already discussed and Rupa raised, uh, I mean, her objection to it. But others, I would like to hear any of you has that what um, Dr. Acharya used reprivatization, reprivatization of PSU banks. So Dr. Acharya has already said, Rupa said she has her observation, she has her uh, uh, reservations about it. Meanwhile, the last budget spoke about two banks, two public sector banks will be privatized. Uh, they have not been done. So I don't know what the work is on. So any of you, Sonal, um, DK, Anand, uh, Rajeshwari, four of you, can you tell us what's your view on that? Sonal, start with you. Yeah, so I'll keep it short. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I, I think with elections approaching, I would presume this is more on the back burner uh, for now. Uh, but as a concept, uh, I mean, I don't think privatization is like a magic wand that solves all the problems. So what you're looking at is essentially a more efficient organization with less interference, greater productivity uh, and, you know, various other characteristics that you would want in an enterprise. Uh, maybe it comes in with privatization, maybe it doesn't. But I mean, to my mind, privatization is you know, is not necessarily reform. Okay. Any? Can I, can I add? Yeah. Yep. Uh, quickly, and I'll, I'll add to what Sonal mentioned. Uh, I'm kind of with Viral on this one. Uh, yeah. I, I refer to the uh, PJNI committee report of 2014 May. I think that's the best document I've seen, which makes a case. It's not a privatization document, but it talks about the fact that your NPAs are higher in public sector enterprises, possibly because of fiscal dominance of some political dominance of some form. Uh, it's not efficient. Your uh, Dinesh Khara gets whatever 40 lakhs an annum, which makes no sense for the size of his balance sheet that he's running. Um, the, the point is, if you can at least bring, like in the case of DBS in, in Singapore, which is supposed to be owned by the government of Singapore, but yet has some kind of operational autom autonomy so that the government does not kind of interact on a daily basis. So if you have a bank investment company, if you bring public sector enterprises under the uh, you know Companies Act, uh, bring it under one you know, regulator of the RBRs and DFS and RBI, I think it will do a world of good. So even if you don't do privatization, at least give them functional autonomy and allow them to operate as, as uh, commercial enterprises. Rajeshwari, you, want to, you, you wanted to yeah. come in. Yes, please. Uh, I, I agree with Viral because I think what happens when you have a large chunk of public sector banks and private banks as well simultaneously operating, it does not create a level playing field as far as banking regulation is concerned. Because then what happens is if the public sector banks have a large amount of NPAs, then the RBI presumably comes under pressure to not let the banks disclose the NPA because the banks disclosing the NPAs would then mean that the government would have to recapitalize the bank as the main shareholder. And that puts pressure on the government's fiscal. So then there is a, there's a more uh, incentive to push the entire thing out in the future so that nobody gets to disclose the bad news because the entire thing gets hijacked by 70% of the banking sector, which is owned by the government. And the, also the corollary effect of what that happens is if you have such a large part of the banking sector under government ownership, as we have seen and we have heard anecdotal evidence of, there's a lot of phone lending that happens. I mean, you get calls from the ministers saying you have to lend to such and such industrial houses irrespective of their financial viability. And then when the loans go bad, there is once again no recognition because, again, there is a whole moral hazard that is creeping in. So I think that by very presence, public sector banks create inefficiency in the system. I'm not saying it's a, a panacea to just privatize. I think there is there also needs to be a lot of changes to Banking Regulation Act simultaneously in order to create a well-performing competitive banking system. But I would not rule out privatization. I think both of them. Thanks. Need to Thanks. Yeah, both um, yeah, Viral, Dr. Acharya's book not only talked about reprivatization, he also spoke about the dual control that should be that should be which former governors um, repeatedly had been talking about. Uh, Rupa, you wanted to say something then? Yes, Ashima also. because my yeah, position Rupa. was misunderstood. Please. I'm not an advocate of public sector banks or anything. What I'm saying yeah. that if yeah. fiscal dominance has weakened uh, the regulatory apparatus, then how can we say that, you know, privatization will give us better outcomes. And we have okay. seen that it is it has not given. Secondly, you have to take into account the developmental needs of India. 
टूडे यू नो योर जनधन योजना और सो मेनी फ्लैगशिप स्कीम्स गवर्नमेंट इज मेक यू नो मेकिंग यूज ऑफ पब्लिक सेक्टर बैंक टू इम्प्लीमेंट दो विच प्राइवेट सेक्टर बैंक विल विलिंगली डू दैट इवन प्राइवेट प्रायोरिटी सेक्टर लेंडिंग टारगेट्स आर नॉट अचीव बाय देम मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम्स एंड दे हैव टू पे फाइन्स दिस एंड दैट so point is that improving the governance uh, corporate governance and that was the crux of uh, dr pj nayak uh-huh. committee report and another thing i want to say that see how on dfi structure we have come full circle you know we have done away with that uh, structure and then we we were left with no institutions to take care of uh, project finance infrastructure finance commercial banks including private banks could not manage it similarly i feel that if we do away with uh, institutions uh, uh, there will be a whole uh, gap uh, in the whole uh, financial intermediation uh, process okay. and Thanks, then, you know p- p- private sector banks will run it as a b- b- portfolio management company Thanks. when certain Thanks, things Rupa. is not yeah. earning this thing they will chop okay. off that business ashima you wanted to put in you want i agree with that. rupa and for those who come from ideological positions on privatization i think you must remember the indian context we have a very diverse population and also yeah. for financial stability diversity helps so institutions that take different views but their gov- better governance is important and i joined idbi bank as a director because i wanted to understand npas it had the largest npas and i saw that they are very serious about reform they're lending to retail they're doing risk based lending so i was not surprised when the rbi and the fsr got the npa number wrong they had done very good provisioning and it came down so good regulations can i find public sector banks are more serious about regulations they follow the letter of compliance much more than private sector banks which try to follow you know find loop ways and and so okay. on yeah okay okay dk I, you want to you want to add anything Quickly. yeah i just wa- just wanted to say that uh, anyway i think in india the share of private sector in the overall business is rising so in in some sense the efficiency in the biz- uh, in the banking sector is rising now privatization will speed up that process there's no doubt about it and if you if you follow the pjni committee uh, reports i think that's going to make the system more efficient so both these are going to make the system more efficient and i think it's a you can choose i mean you have to do either i mean you can't be sitting okay. in between i mean thanks dk just a piece of information is this i mean you can continue to say that psu bank share is now come down from 70 to probably 60 62 odd but incrementally you will see there much much less i think close to between 70 and 80% between both for uh, assets and liabilities are for, for private sector banks yeah. okay with private sector one so, point the man if there yeah, is time please. Yeah. you know i just wanted to give you a very concrete example because no one actually spoke about it uh, i i don't have an ideological position actually please now. quick it's, quickly there sir. is a lot of data there is data on productivity there is data on npas and rupa for everything you said the npas at public banks on average have been far in excess of private sector banks yes there is a rogue private sector bank it has been fixed the other two where the ceo mds you can debate whether they were fired in time or not they are out and they have turned around both of those banks have now turned around we don't have that ability even with a weak regulator i i do consider rbi a weak banking regulator having seen what i saw it 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 does get the messages late it does react late but even with its lateness it's able to actually turn around those banks whereas in public sector banks that's much much harder and i'll just give one concrete example of how a regulation to to rajeshwari's point how a system wide regulation gets botched we were supposed to move to ilfs uh, sorry to what is it called the I, I, ifrs uh, the yeah. ifrs accounting system yeah. for banks yeah. it was supposed to do expected loss provisioning yeah you have to provision for losses ahead of time you can't do it after the losses have arisen we are still stuck in the 70s and 80s system of provisioning the entire private system had prepared to move to ifrs okay one fine day it was decided that this will not happen you can put two and two together as to why this didn't happen okay because some of our public sector banks i won't take names would have actually started reporting losses under the ifrs system we could have adopted the ifrs system because basel allows you to do a five year phase in of the capital that is required under the new system but there was six months down the line a big event was happening nationally 
and there was no capital to be laid out in those six months in 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 addition to the banks an act has to be changed in india to change the accounting system of public sector banks public sector banks are required to file their accounts as per a act of the government of india it's not something that the accounting system determines it's something that the finance ministry decides how the accounts of public sector banks will be reported there is a pro forma statement under the act the uh, the, the br act so unless you change that india cannot adopt ifrs so in my view how can a banking system move forward when you have these kinds of complete idiosyncrasies which are in the system and so i, I think this is all anachronistic to say that a that a publicly listed entities accounting statement should be based on an act of parliament this is an anachronistic system you know this how can we have minority investors owning shares of this company and it's not the accounting boards or the securities regulator who decides how thanks. they are going to report their accounts okay. Th- thanks i'm sorry i'm sorry sorry I'm sorry we can, we can go on <laughs> it's uh, 10 past 8 india time we are running out of time there are a lot of things to sorry, discuss sorry sorry uh, but yeah. be- before we come to the last round uh, your recommendations in the current context i want one particular thing maybe one minute each uh, dr acharya has already said but rest of you uh, you know his book has been talking about repeatedly the pressure on rbi unabated and intensified and then he talk up he spoke about how rbi manages the government borrowing program i mean the cost of borrowing program and then he says rbi is uh, cont- rbi has been continuing in its role as a debt manager so i think his implication is this rbi should not be the government's debt manager so i would like each of you to just have a minute of each anand beginning you because you were you were handling treasury also right in standard charter yeah, i thought this so, time will be the reverse way from sonal but anyway, i very so quickly. so one, one one minute each please anand so so um i i do think having a separate uh, borrowing office as uh, i think one already exists in delhi in in a rudimentary shape uh, does make sense by the way uh, lots of countries for instance france has a separate treasury Uh, which does the borrowing program it's not the central bank which does the borrowing program it, I, i think it does make make sense uh, but this, this fundamental issue will always remain uh, tamalda uh, even if you have a separate entity which is doing the borrowing program nothing stops a government from calling up the rbi and saying good i need i have a problem and i need you to manage interest rates for me um, to look at one of the central bankers i i really respect was dr reddy so I, i think you ultimately need people of the caliber of dr reddy who can manage these these uh, uh, you know tensions properly uh, okay raise your voice when required you know, lower your voice when required but actually manage these tensions okay and- registry registry separate debt debt uh, rbi should not be involved in managing government debt i uh, completely agree i think there was a time when the pdma reform was discussed at length and i have no idea what happened to that discussion i think we need to bring that discussion back on the table but i do agree with anand that it's not just about doing a reform and setting up a pdma because the way things are going even without with that it's highly possible that rbi will go back to doing what it is doing end of the day i think it boils down to the government fixing its finances and putting that house in order so that the fiscal does not go completely out of control and put zonal yeah no i would agree on this i think the risks around uh, inflation are uh, much more significant than uh, we are uh, giving it uh, uh, credit for so i am completely in uh, favor okay mm-hmm. at least at one on one point everybody is agreeing with dr acharya rupa i also completely agree with uh, separation of uh, these offices and uh, i want inflation targeting framework to come back uh, in full spirit dk Uh, should well, RBI should RBI continue to be involved in managing government debt? Well, I think if if a separate uh, if it, the debt management function is separated, I think some of the problems that Dr. Acharya is mentioning will uh, probably go away. I mean, if it is implemented in letter and spirit. Okay. Uh, last word coming from MPC member Ashima Goel. If a public debt management office becomes more efficient and more market oriented it's desirable but I would just flag that in the US and UK where they talked about the separation when public debt went up it came back to the central bank because it needs to be managed smoothly you know when you have a crisis and debt goes up and the way to bring it down is to have real interest rates less than growth rate that snowball effect and in emerging markets particularly you need to reduce volatility of growth real interest and growth I think the 
the institution which is critical for India now is a fiscal council. And this more for, for the state level, where there's a lot of inefficiency for improving accounting system standards at the state level. Because, you know, Rajiv Gandhi used to say that 15 paise of government spending goes to the person who it's targeted for. Now, maybe it's increased to 50 paise. But there is still a lot of leakage at state levels. You need much more transparency there, institution building. There. That is the most critical okay. institution currently in the Indian context. Thanks. Thanks, Ashima. We are almost 8.15. Uh, so we, we decided to close it between 8.15 and 8.30. So in the best case scenario, we have about 10 minutes left because then the Shamir uh, co-chair of Scotch will come to conclude it uh, with his comment on Thanksgiving. So last the, the last round is I would ask each of you uh, to give your um, suggestions, which including Dr. Acharya. And I will start with Dr. Acharya and I'll end with Ashima because Ashima, you are some, some way representing you. You are representing India, of course, and, but you are an MPC member. So in the current scenario, we saw that immediately February, uh, February Reserve Bank of India policy, it continues to be extremely accommodative. There is no change in the stance, uh, um, barring one MPC member who is pretty vocal about it. The rest of them are all... Okay, things and and uh, since then things have changed. I mean, I'm talking about uh, the geopolitical situation is this. So Reserve Bank of India's 4.5% uh, inflation target, it seems to be, and Dr. Ajaria's book is talking about uh, always, uh, you know, essentially RBI is off the target. It's uh, it always on the downside when in inflation targeting. So now we are running the risk of uh, once again this 4.5 percent inflation targeting probably will not work. Uh, we are running. Uh, we are scared probably a higher inflation steering at. We do not know whether it's temporary will continue. We are talking about uh, current account deficit. We are talking about growth. Everything. So at in this current scenario and then um, the next April policy is coming over. So I would like each of you just a minute or maximum one and a half minute, what would be your advice? And of course, keeping in mind the overall uh, theme of the discussion, which is Dr. Acharya's book, Quest for, for Restoring Financial Stability in India. So financial stability is the broad spectrum it remains. What should Reserve Bank of India do in April and going forward? First, Dr. Acharya, just uh, yeah, one make... minute, sir. Yeah, yeah, three points. Uh, one, I think uh, RBI should, in my opinion, change its stance to neutral and then raise rates uh, just to signal to the market that it means business on inflation. I think just saying that it means business is not good enough. I think actions speak louder than words. Uh, second, I think the government will have to find resources to transfer to the poor segments of the society. Uh, Dr. Rangarajan has proposed a tax right at the top. Uh, I think it's a good idea because it's uh, it's really been, that's where all the wealth has been transferred post-pandemic, in my view, through monetary policy. And there was a huge tax cut for corporations prior to that. Yes, it's helped them. They've deleveraged. That's good. Uh, but you need, you need the last mile person to be able to spend and consume. Uh, their wages are actually getting eroded at the present levels of inflation. So in my view, the fact that the wages are not rising while inflation is rising is actually bad news for the economy. It's not good news for the economy. Let me okay. just stop with those two. Okay. So uh, Rupa, over to you. One minute, uh, first, three points. Yeah. Yes. First of all, uh, I want uh, uh, the uh, inflation targeting uh, framework to again uh, uh, to be followed in a full letter and spirit and uh, to begin with uh, changing the accommodative stance because uh, it is no more helping uh, uh, stabilize conditions. Actually, it has started going up, responding to fundamentals. So it will it's making actually policy apparatus more ineffective. So better to uh, fulfill the rational expectations of market participants and make the whole framework more predictable. Secondly, need for independent fiscal council, both at the central government and state government levels, because they, you know that council should make the underlying macroeconomic framework more consistent with fiscal calculations which is uh, not the case. For instance, the oil price assumed in uh, uh, budget uh, uh, making exercise was less than $1.70 when we, it was closer to $1.90. So, you know, those kind of uh, uh, distortions could be remedied. 
thirdly uh, we need to do uh, you know give direct support to unorganized sector and informal economy especially mandrega and all because uh, rural demand uh, is uh, you know it will act as a major uh, deterrent for growth going forward it, uh, so the, uh, doing that is a uh, absolutely uh, whatever the precondition if you want uh, okay. you know growth uh, to recover Thanks. and fourthly about ibc because yeah. the ibc have the requirement is for 360 judges and currently there are only 60 judges so they have okay. to scale up ibc because sure. it is it has proved to be an effective mechanism thanks rupa sonal one minute key three four suggestions one minute okay so first i think uh, uh, macro stability and regain uh, credibility i think uh, there's one thing saying that inflation is high but it's supply side and therefore i will look through it's another to basically say that inflation is all base effect and is going to come down to four uh, uh, and therefore we are supporting growth so i think the reserve bank needs to regain its credibility on the inflation targeting framework uh, there has been flip flop on reverse repo which was supposed to be the liquidity tool and now can only be changed uh, when the stance change so i think that credibility is number one uh, second link to that uh, i think stance needs to change uh, the uh, macro environment has changed policy needs to be normalized we are no longer living in uh, emergency uh, settings Uh, okay. policy cannot be in uh, emergency uh, and third uh, more broadly tamil i think uh, fiscal clearly is extremely important uh, from a more medium term perspective we actually haven't seen any clear game plan both on the revenue and the expenditure side uh, to believe that inflation uh, fiscal is actually going to come down so i think broadly i would say both on monetary and fiscal we need to regain credibility thanks thanks so now who come who wants to come next quickly um uh, okay we are um, uh, dk yeah uh, so i think first of all the since the last policy i think inflation risk has gone up significantly i think that is very clear i think from all sides so the it's i think i would agree with dr acharya that new stance needs to be changed because without that the interest rates won't change and then we as crisel are expecting uh, 50 to 75 basis uh, rate hike uh, in in the in the coming fiscal year so the second is on the 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 strategy of the government is to to, to revive growth is to push uh, uh, push infrastructure investment up and then that will lead to growth and then it will also help consumption but the point is that the consumption has not reached the self sustaining level and it will not reach that on it will take some time so with okay. till the time it reaches there i think there is need to support the smaller segment i think i completely agree that i think there has to be direct support to them otherwise i think uh, uh, the pain will will increase only because of That's now higher fuel inflation rajeshwari Uh, so uh, two three suggestions one is that i think the rbi should go back to the legally mandated objective of price stability and maybe the government should instruct the rbi to do so uh, because we have seen from our 2019 experience how fast inflation can spiral out of control and currently i think we are underestimating the risk to inflation and relatedly i think we should normalize all the rates that have been addressed during the pandemic period and go back to the situation where we had a fixed weight liquidity adjustment facility corridor where the repo rate was relevant and the reverse repo rate was moving in consonance with that so i think we need to go back to that and the rbi needs to communicate to the market transparently that it is doing that uh, and i think a third point uh, related would be that the npcs discussion need to widen a little bit because right now we are talking about rbi managing bond deals i won't be surprised if soon the come situation comes when the rbi is managing the exchange rate um and then again we are talking about this uh, this dilemma and trilemma and quadrilemma of the rbi okay. so i think all of that needs to come within the discussion of the npcs because this affects monetary policy one last part kamal is i think the biggest crisis now while we're talking about inflation etc is also growth and jobs because private investment has been sluggish for a while and i think a lot of thought and consideration needs to be paid by the government as to why that is happening and what steps can be taken because the only way to come thanks. out of a high debt scenario is to have a high growth thanks rajeshri before ashima has a last word anand over to you uh, one minute can... just a minute yeah sure. um i'm going to stick to rbi and npc and i'm going to stick to inflation as the yes. objective okay now uh, uh, because we've started to program ourselves to think that repo rate controls inflation which i kind of droned on about for a long time i completely disagree with that 
high liquidity banking liquidity and low interest rates that th at this point of time when your credit offtake is just at 7.2% cagr over 2 years is not creating inflation by itself it's not creating money okay only when credit offtake goes into 12 15 17% that's how, that's when you have to worry so i don't agree at all that liquidity or short term interest rates are causing inflation at this point of time however longer end financial suppression of rates the fact that rbi has sat on the you know interest rates for a long time at 6% the 10 year bond yields you have created negative real interest rates for savers for medium term savers and therefore you have pushed pushed money money into gold last year we bought 50 billion dollars worth of gold imported okay that's because you've kept your real interest rates low and therefore money has gone into equity markets has gone into into gold has gone into bitcoin god knows what and what else longer end rates can be higher the fact that there is a fiscal problem our entire macros are going to look very very bad out of this out of silver's ukraine war uh, longer end rates can be right government should pay the right price for borrowing what it is borrowing yeah. and that will bring a lot of financial stability in the picture thanks last word ashima as you said you represent india and you represent rohit sharma actually who can who is the captain of all form of cricket no Even no i'm, I'm just a, just an unimportant Achha. member 50, of the mpc 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, and 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 these are my personal views i have okay. no you know yeah. so but but sure, what please. my own view as a researcher is that the last decade and the sort of growth slowdown or lost decade for india was because we overreacted to external shocks so okay. as a policy maker my view would be try to smooth the impact of external shocks on india as much as possible mm. with being full attention to the inflation targeting etc and then the thing about the rbi being behind the curve i disagree with that because my view is they started adjustment last year you know in the indian context in the us interest rates are very low near zero so what they pay banks is very little here if you if you without withdrawing some excess liquidity you start uh, raising rates it can be very expensive i don't know if viral agrees with that so so you need to first withdraw liquidity and they started doing that and now given the external shocks in the current environment with ukraine and so on we'll see outflows we'll see liquidity flowing out very quickly and in the fact we might switch to a situation of where liquidity is too low which happened in 2018 so we need to make sure that and and part of the reason why the reverse repo has been deemphasized is that we are following the reforms that urjit and viral started which is that you move to a liquidity management framework where the repo is around the repo is the only relevant rate the reverse repo is irrelevant so the liquidity management is such that you stay around the repo and with the vrrr that is what is happening in effect so the rbi is not behind the curve the signal they try to say it's rebalancing the market took it as adjustment has started and factored in so many rate hikes which were sort of not correct because an adjustment has to be gradual otherwise it can hurt jobs and employment create large output sacrifice so we are doing the gradual adjustment remember the us fed has only said that it will start withdrawing qe in march when their inflation is much in excess of their tar tar target we are our inflation is within our tolerance band and we started withdrawing liquidity since last year thanks ashima thank, thank i i thanks i thank all of you for being so candid and uh, unfortunately uh, it's 8:27 so i would not waste time um uh, i would not i would not summarize uh, i mean let let uh, samir kocha who's the organizer and uh, who's hosting the show uh, come in and close it we have already exceeded our time and we could have actually trust you we could have, we could have gone on till one more hour and uh, uh, with more points and uh, more interesting debate but unfortunately run out of time so from my side thank you thanks all of you and over to you samir thank you very much tamil uh, this is way above my intellectual grade the kind of uh, discussion that you had i understand very little of all the things that you talked about i Uh, came into it very apprehensive and worried. Uh, I am getting out of it even more apprehensive and more worried about where the economy is going. That's the sense I got. Not that I understood very much of all the big jargons that were discussed. And I hope that uh, that uh, you know discomfort is ill-founded. And you know we are actually doing something uh, right. And RBI does have its credibility intact. It has not, in fact, become an extension of government of India, uh, which it is not supposed to be. And and i and i hope that there are better days ahead uh, what i really worry about is that there are very few spaces left for this kind of a candid discussion open discussion and uh, academic discussion we are possibly the last guy standing still supporting it still funding it 
without any sponsorships really any without any support and at the same time doing this for india without any fear saying that this is what we believe is good for our country and we must all stand for that well yes plurality of view is welcome it is the sense of uh, democracy but plurality must come with uh, credibility whatever you stand for should uh, be seen you know you should be coming from an honest space is what i believe and as long as we are all doing that then we are doing a great job thanks a lot dr viral acharya uh, thank you ashima ji thank you dharma kirti thank you sonal ji thank you rupa ji thank you gusharan thank you dr anant narayan thank you rajeshwari and thank you uh, rohan for sitting through this and I look forward to many more such discussions and hopefully some of the outcomes that we uh, document will get implemented and hopefully through this platform the concern of everybody is getting amplified and communicated namaskar thank you thank you thank you so much everyone for the candid discussions that was great thanks a lot thank Goodbye. you just one thing there are many many there are many many questions but i could not raise any uh, one of them because everything has been discussed so th that's why we could not i did not take any questions okay so thank you all stay safe <laughs>